Hey, everybody, this is Alex and Ben. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge. There's a need for local news, and local news is evolving. You know, a visual image is very much a part of our everyday in ways that we don't even fully recognize, and that's not going anywhere anytime soon. The tools for media production have never been this prolific at any point. The oncoming adults of today have grown up with smartphones. They've grown up with this technology, and the amount of producers changed. It's elevated. Anyone can produce an opinion. Now people are getting it in their pocket, on their computer. They're waking up to it. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. And that's true now more than ever. All right, everyone, we're really excited to bring you a truly special episode today. We have our own producer and other co-founder of the podcast, who is the incredible Buddy Terry. Uh, he was born in Portland and raised in rural St. Helens, Oregon. He's a graduate from Oregon State, and he is now getting his master's degree in journalism at the University of California. And he also supported Ben in a number of his endeavors. So that may have you question about his, you know, ethical backgrounds and all that sort of things. But uh, but it was a great episode in general. But Ben, what did you think of Buddy? I love Buddy Terry. <laughs> uh, I have known Buddy Terry for a long time. And he is, I think he comes across in this podcast. He's just such a genuine guy um, who's incredibly generous, incredibly kind. He helped me when I ran for school board the first time he put together um, this incredible video where um, all the students who volunteered on my campaign, like some of them got interviewed and he, he like filmed them going door to door and it was awesome. And um, he's just really talented as well. So I've always felt lucky. I think we feel lucky that he is, you know, as a co-founder, he's volunteering his time in the middle. Like he gave up a lot of his clients. He had a bunch of clients up here. Um, before he went to grad school and he gave them up to go to grad school and uh, he believes in what we're doing and wants to stay a part of it, which I appreciate. And the other thing is this program he's in is actually very prestigious um, and it's a big deal that he got in and got selected to go there. So I'm very, I, I do think like he is destined to be like a big time documentary filmmaker or something like that someday. So buddy, we are, we appreciate you and we're very lucky to have you. And I also think the conversation was really interesting, right? Like we talk about politics, we talk about urban rural divide and buddy has a very unique perspective from that um, as someone who I think identifies as progressive, but as he says in the episode, like has some, um, did he say social conservative leanings? Um, uh, no, conservative on issues like gun rights and things right, like that. Right. So yeah, I think it's a great episode. I think people are really going to enjoy it. Um, and you also get a better sense of like how the podcast actually works. Yeah. And that was uh, one thing I know some people have been asking for is kind of like, we thought this would be a perfect episode for it is like the back end of not only how our podcast works, but just how easy it is to set up a podcast yourself. Like if you're in a part of Oregon and you don't think, you know, folks are being served with information, like it's pretty darn easy to just go ahead and like start something like this yourself. Uh as long as you have someone like Buddy who can kind of help with the back end stuff. But, uh, but yeah, overall, I thought it was a really, uh, really fun, insightful conversation. And uh, Buddy is just the absolute man and really helps. I think he also helps us really frame a lot of these episodes uh, really well as well. So, I mean, in addition to kind of the technical side, he definitely has some of the visionary component of it too. And, uh, and I also want to give a shout out to Buddy for the, the YouTube page. If you haven't, um, if you haven't checked it out, we do have a YouTube channel. Um, I'm sure if you search Oregon Bridge on YouTube, you will find it. But Buddy does, he he goes through and edits each episode. It's not like a direct upload. Like he's taking Alex's, um, the way that Alex records and the way that I record are different. I do gallery, he does speaker view and he'll like cut between. So it's actually a visually appealing medium, despite the fact that you're looking at both of us <laughs> during <laughs> during the video. But for those of you who are interested in the YouTube version, um, but Buddy's like primary background is actually like vi video. That's what he's, his um, specialty is. So he is bringing that gift to us as well with the YouTube channel. So check out the YouTube channel to support the, the work on that side of things. Yeah, and uh, we'll just dive right into the episode now. Uh, please go ahead and subscribe if your podcast platform allows us. Uh, give us five stars and also feel free to write us a review. Uh, we've had some very funny reviews, which uh, <laughs> made Ben and I both crack up. Uh, whoever Orange is Madness in, uh, I thought that was hilarious. But we, we do hope we earn your five star instead of your four stars. So we will have to have Senator Johnson on at some point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thanks again for tuning in and we'll get right into it. See you, everyone. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge. We are very excited today uh, because our guest is someone who has been working with us for, we decided, what do we decide, eight months now on this podcast. 
It is our producer, Buddy Terry. He's been a friend of mine since I think we were in high school, Buddy. Um, 2015. So it's been a while. Uh, how are you doing? How's life? You just went, you just started at grad school. Tell us what that's like. Uh, how's life? Life is good. Life has been, life has brought a lot of change these past few months. You know, um, this, this was really my out of Oregon move. Um, I'm in Berkeley now. I'm pursuing a graduate uh, degree in master's of journalism um, and specifically documentary film production and visual uh, track. And yeah, it's uh it's been a little bit chaotic for sure, but it's really nice being around like-minded individuals um, and to be back in academia, really. Um, that's been pretty refreshing. Our greatest fear was that you were going to go off to grad school and be like, guys, I can't, I can't do this podcast thing anymore. <laughs> but we are lucky that uh, those of our, our, uh, our audience who is watching on YouTube uh, can see that they are in the producer buddy Terry world headquarters in uh, in Berkeley. It seems like you got the right setup there. And, and and I would also say everybody needs to go on YouTube to look at Buddy's mustache because <laughs> it's, it's truly an out of this world phenomenon. Now hey, some, there's some good things that came out of COVID. Let me tell you, and that's that's up there. <laughs> we'll have to interview interview the girlfriend and, and and see if she agrees. But now, Buddy, <laughs> this is the most important question. I've wanted to ask you, and I, I know the answer to this, but I imagine what the viewers have been wondering. Is your name actually Buddy? No. I mean, I've gone by it for my entire life. My name is Burl. Um, I'm the third Burl David Terry in my family. Um, my father gave me the name Buddy, uh, named me after his childhood hero. Um, his name is Bud. It's my uncle. Nice. And where did you grow up in Oregon, Buddy? I was born in Portland, but I've never really lived in Portland proper. Um, I grew up in St. Helens. It's about 45 minutes toward Astoria, down Highway 30. And then, uh, yeah, went to St. Helens High School and, you know, was grew up in that town. But then uh, around 12, we uh, my family bought some property in Deer Island. Um, and we grew. I was raised on a small farm basically until I went off to college. In St. Helens, correct me if I'm wrong, the claim to fame is the, it's the, the Halloween. where Halloween Town was filmed, right? Yeah, you already know. Hey, you know, tourism, tour, this, the town needs it. It's publicity. And, you know, it's cool. I think you, you, you'll you get some locals that are like, yeah, whatever, you know, Halloween Town, sure. But it's a big thing now, and it's drawing people there, and it's drawing money. Um, and specifically, the downtown is uh, prospering these days, which is really nice to see. Well, and St. St. Helens is one of those parts of Oregon that, um, you know, I, I, you, maybe you can tell us, but like, it's not like the economy is thriving. I think it was a, a timber dependent um, county back when that was a thing in Oregon. Um, so I imagine, I imagine the tourism economy is probably a, a welcome addition for a lot of the folks who live there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, St. Helens and Columbia County, um, pretty much all you, if you go to Astoria through Portland, you actually pass through like seven or eight towns in the, you know, it only takes about an hour, maybe hour 15 to get to Astoria and St. Helens and Deer Island are two of them. And they, um, they felt that for sure. They were both timber towns, just um, a lot like Vernonia, Oregon still is too. But more than that, uh, when I was growing up, the, uh, a couple other things happened. It was a mill town too, like, and Trojan specifically, um, there's a big nuclear plant that looks like some, some have, uh, speculated that it is modeled, um, in the Simpsons. It's that <laughs> one, um, because oh, there's a okay. guy fish pulling out of the pond and all this and that. <laughs> um, but that, uh, that shut down, they imploded Trojan. Um, and that was big and the mills closed down too, and dramatically scaled back. Um, so yeah, that really like bled the economy for a long time. So, so yeah, it's nice to see new money. I, I, I do want to take people under the hood a little bit. So during our during our recordings, Alex and I are on a chat um, on Zoom where we will we're trying to coordinate like, OK, you you know, we, we're, we have a set of questions that we go into these interviews with, but we often have to adjust like depending on how the answers go and how the flow of the conversation is going. So we'll use chat to coordinate. Occasionally, Titus will do what he just did to me when uh, Buddy, you were talking about. <laughs> Uh, what had happened to St. Helens? He goes, ask him why Obama betrayed America. <laughs> so this is this is a good question, you know. I think I think a lot of the audience they want to know. know. It is why. a terrible question, but it does actually um, sort of lead into what I did want to ask you about, which is you talked, 
you just talked a little bit about St. Helens. I don't think anyone would describe St. Helens as a uh, liberal bastion by any chance. What are your personal politics? Like, what do you, I'm obviously I, I'm the progressive of the show and Titus is the conservative. Where do you fall on the political spectrum and like how involved are you in politics? That's pretty interesting. We've had lots of talks about this too. I'm definitely progressive leftward leaning on most things. I would not consider myself a moderate by any means, um, specifically when it comes to um, the social issues. Like I think, I think government has a big role to play in our quality of living and elevating that for um, the bottom, you know, 99%. But there is also this other side of me, as I mentioned, I, you know, I grew up on a farm. Um, my family specifically on my dad's side is, very, I would say, pretty much conservative across the board. Um, you know, I grew up hunting, I grew up out in the outdoors and learning that appreciation for the outdoors and, um, and appreciation for space and value of privacy. So when it comes to like some of the bigger um, hot button issues like gun rights for you know, for example, um, I feel strongly about that. And that, you know, that doesn't necessarily align with the, uh, the left's agenda all the time. But yeah, I, uh, I de- I'm a registered Democrat. Um, definitely proud to say that. Don't have plans on changing that anytime soon. Sorry, Alex. That's um, right, Alex. <laughs> but and, Buddy told me he actually voted for Trump. And, and <laughs> no, I did not vote for Trump. I just blew that secret that in day, front of everybody. I want to, but... but um, <laughs> Uh, buddy, I do have a question though, sort of in that vein is that, uh, obviously you've listened to every single episode of the podcast and we've had quite a degree of different guests, right? I mean, we've had people who are super progressive on all fronts. We've had more moderate Democrats. We've had some moderate Republicans. We've had some folks who are pretty conservative. Have you seen kind of your own politics, maybe even evolve just a little bit from hearing some of these different perspectives? Like obviously part of the podcast is to have long form discussions where we can really dive into these issues. I'm curious if any guests in particular have like either changed or maybe even just evolved a little bit, like some of your own personal politics on some issues. It's definitely adding to the opinion. I don't know if there's any specific episode that's like really been striking to me. And also there's, there's another rule here, even though these are like, we, we can talk more about this, but as, as the editor, I'm listening kind of for different things. So it's not always a direct engagement with the content. Um, even though I do end up listening to each episode, like, you know, two or three times, but, um, I would say like, I found Alex Scarlato's episode really interesting. Um, as far as something that's going to resonate with an Oregonian and I had, I'd never really listened to the libertarian like perspective, all that in that, with that much depth. Um, but I totally understood what he was saying. I, I thought um, a lot of his points were logical and it makes sense for Eastern Oregon because like I said, you know, um, I grew up in Eastern Oregon a lot, actually. I never lived out there, but like that's where we've hunted. And it totally is like, it is a complete demographic change when you get out there. It's a complete change of mindset, space. And that's, you know, that's what we're talking about readily here. Um, it's an important thing that needs to be acknowledged and it's it contributes to you know, Oregon's makeup, um, political identity. Um, but yeah, otherwise, um, no, there's been a couple that I've found really striking. Uh, Sarah Gelser's was, that was a heartbreaking episode. If you haven't listened to that yet, um, that's, those are the kind of things that, um, need to be talked about. Absolutely. That was a, the Gelser episode was one of my favorites for sure. Um, and I think the, the Alex Carlotta's quote that I keep thinking about was, Oregonians love their guns and their weed, which, <laughs> which so, is someone need, he should literally put that on a campaign. <laughs> I feel like people would love that. But so, I would buy that shirt just for the funnies. But. So the I think the, one other interesting thing about you and your politics is one uh, the, I saw you there at the 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 racial justice protests in downtown Portland. Um, you had a pretty hands on experience down there. I mean you. I, you, maybe you can explain to us, but you were going down not like once or twice. You were there pretty frequently covering things, making videos for people, interviewing some of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Was that a, um, a, a work project for you or was that a personal passion for you or somewhere in between? And, and what do you make of the Black Lives Matter movement in Portland? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question because um, that was summer 2020 was really pivotal for me. Um, as far as my career, you know, the past post-college I've been, I've been just producing 
a, a lot of private stuff, a lot of like corporate media, um, and really just, you know, making a career out of this and, and, and then using the camera as a tool. Um, that doesn't always yield the most critical media, right? Um, and for me, as COVID descended and everything started catching fire, um, I couldn't imagine myself anywhere else. I felt like I needed to be down there. This was a moment in my life that I'd never even conceived of, honestly. I didn't think we I would ever witness, you know, what I would call like it's a it's a neo civil rights movement. Um, and that's what it felt like. It, you know, on the ground, it felt like there was a lot of uncertainty. It felt, I'm not gonna say it felt like war, but uh it was conflict was everywhere and every moment was unexpected. Um but yes, it was sort of a, a passion project. I wasn't shooting for any sort of publication. Um, and that's kind of what's important about this in, you know, in tangent with this, tr this change, I was applying to grad schools and stuff and thinking about that next step and reentering into academia. Um, and as I mentioned, now I'm in a, I'm in a journalism program, you know, that was, um, that was motivated by this. I was going to say, is that a direct line from you documenting the protests to going to grad school for with the journalism degree? Yeah, it's it's the practical application that I want to see. And I mean, as we talk about on this podcast all the time, it's there's a need for local news and local news is evolving like that. And that's one thing that you was so was so apparent on the ground. It was that so many people were using their own personal platforms and their own tools, whether it's phone, whether it's GoPro suspended on a 15 foot, you know, like, uh, like stick that's just live streaming the whole thing with like external batteries to it, or, you know, actual pro grade equipment, or they're reporting for someone. Um, that's people came out in droves and were they too, I think felt like whether they were publishing for publishing or reporting for someone, they needed to document this and wanted to. And so, yeah, to, you know, the quick answer is yes, that was, mm -hmm that played a really big role in this because all through that, um, there got, there came a point where I, because I hadn't been, I haven't been in a newsroom, you know, in Oregon or really in that space, it became challenging to show this, um, this material to people for in a couple different ways. I mean, we could talk about like privacy and, and, you know, all of that. So the government started cracking down on that stuff, um, and tracing Twitter feeds and, and Instagrams and all this, but, um, I hit a, I hit a wall a little bit where I had all this stuff and I wasn't sure how to show it to people. Um, and so that's really what I, I want to learn right now. Um, that's why I'm here. And, uh, that was, it, yeah, it played a pretty pivotal role. So post-grad school, um, what is your degree, your degree programs two years? Yep. So after two years is up, what is the dream job, um, that you want to, like, it's interesting that you're, you're getting a journalism degree, but I don't think you're suggesting you want to go like necessarily like work for a newspaper. Um, so what have you thought about what um, the combination of your skills and academic training would translate into? Yeah. Um, and I'm entertaining that more and more um, as you know, where I'm in my second week, of my program right now. And it's so much of what we've been talking about is the evolution of media and platforms. Right. And there's a wonderful, like it was shown in a, in a lecture, actually wonderful little video of how the New York times has evolved visually. It's a, there are screenshots or, you know, scans of every, every publication basically since its inception. No and kidding. you just watch it become more and more visual straight from text. Um, which is, it's so true. I mean, this is how people are communicating, you know, a reflection, um, you know, a visual image is very much a part of our everyday in ways that we don't even fully recognize. And that's not going anywhere anytime soon. So um, a newspaper, maybe not. Um, but any sort of publication that's also producing video or audio or using these other mediums, that's where I, I am pushing toward. And I mentioned, you know, I, I'm on a doc track. At the end of this year, my plan is to produce my most critical piece of media to date. Um, I don't necessarily know what the subject matter is, to be honest. Um, that's not something that I've nailed down, but yeah. Um, so doc, doc track doesn't mean doctoral degree. It means documentary, right? Documentary in this okay. context. Yeah. We'll see about that later. <laughs> Maybe the <laughs> doctor buddy. <laughs> doctor buddy. <laughs> 
Great. Well, buddy, one of the things, uh, you know, a, a constant piece of feedback that I've gotten on this podcast, both from Oregon politicos and then some politicos who listen in DC is it's never, wow, the quality of the episodes was great. Or wow, that was so interesting of a guest. People always say, how is your sound quality on this <laughs> podcast so good? So I want to I want to take that framing and ask you the very broad question of how do you make a podcast? Like if one of our listeners said, you know, I love what the Oregon Bridge is doing. I want to do this in my own community, right? Maybe they want to do this in Redmond. Maybe they want to do this in Portland. Maybe they want to do a cooking podcast or whatever. Uh, let's just start. What is like the stuff that I need to get started with a podcast? Sure. Um, you know, and this is, aside from a podcast, this can be said about any piece of media that's not just a still photograph. Um, your audio is 80 to 90% of the impact. It's immersive. Audio is immersive. Visuals are great, but if you don't have an immersive audio and a, a clean sounding audio, people aren't going to enjoy it. There's, and they won't even recognize why they don't enjoy it sometimes, but they just won't. It won't be pleasing and it won't be comfortable. Um, so things that you would need, get a decent mic, um, get some editing software. And honestly, the two things you need, you need a mic, which you can use your phone if you want. Like that's, there's, there's some capable technology there. And then you need a host platform. Um, to have a basic podcast, your host platform doesn't have to be a podcast host platform. You know, that can be Instagram. That can be whatever it needs. You need a home for your media and you need the media, um, for the basics. So generally speaking, and I think this is what, this is one of the big reasons why podcasts are becoming so prevalent is they're easy to digest. And now they're relatively like easy to make with bare bones tools, like a phone, and you know a platform now what makes it good um a decent quality mic you need talent you need people that can actually talk um and and work well together and that's uh that's the beauty of this Thank i was gonna say if we could do. find some talent we would really take <laughs> off <laughs> <laughs> um and then there's a process for sure there's a uh, my process specifically because we have a video component to this I take uh, the two different angles that we are recording now, uh, as well as the audio track. I lay them all into Adobe Premiere, which is a video editing timeline. I take it and I cut it up. The primary purpose for this cut is switching between camera angles and then also identifying those big things that you hear at the beginning, those big, those hot button, you know, quotes or, you know, the things that define the episode. And then that's when I cut those out, add them to the beginning. And then after that, I have a final product, a final like audio product, um, export that, video goes out, and then I take that audio and take it back into Audition, um, which is a DAW, and it's designed specifically for like multi-track recording and radio. Um, and then that's where effects get applied, like mastering, noise reduction, you know, ambient stuff like that. And also um, things like big pauses, um, or repetition, um, you know, get removed things like, um, you know, like I just said, those get cut, um, to make it more palatable, uh, easier to digest. There's an important thing that I just want to add before, you know, the end of this answer, there's integrity involved here, right? Like at no point in this podcast, besides things like which I can say, because I'm just going to cut that out, <laughs> um, are going to get removed you know there's no content that's making its way out of these pieces um or subject matter that's a piece of you know that's journalistic integrity and that's what we're our, our goal is here um but yes it, it gets scrubbed it gets there's some fluidity added and that's what i think makes it a lot more palatable i have two two thoughts on this one is you often hear how people often say like oh podcast there's like very low barrier to entry um, it's very easy for, which is true. Um, and as you mentioned, you could do it on your phone, et cetera. But I actually think one thing I have learned from the last, I don't know, eight months or whatever that we've been working on this is it actually is very hard to do it well. Um, like I do think what Titus and I do is actually the easy part. 
um, like we, we put time into it, right? We research our guests, we come up with questions and we try to like be really strategic about that. But the, the uh, listenability isn't a term, but I think you know what I mean. Like having it be like a well-produced podcast is vastly different <laughs> than a poorly produced podcast. And like, you can't get through much more than like one or two episodes. There's a couple of podcasts who I really like their subject matter and I'm very interested in it, but I can't get through like the, the fact that there's a lot of ums there, like there's no music there's It's not, it's not produced. So it's not as entertaining. What I really look forward to, and I hope we can do this someday, but like, so the number one podcast in the world is Titus. Do you know what's the most listened to podcast in the world? Buddy. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The cool thing about Joe Rogan, which very controversial figure figure, we won't weigh in there. He's in a studio that where he's got all, obviously all the most professional equipment. He's got, you know, the best audio systems ever. He's got, I think it would be so cool to have like me and Titus in the same room and you in the same room as the producer with a guest, like post pandemic and post grad school. That is what I would love to see us be able to pull off is like an actual, because I also think like I've enjoyed all of our conversations, but it's different in person. It's a different okay. dynamic. It's a different relationship with the, the, the guest. So that's my hope in the long term is that we can have our own version of like a podcast studio where we can host these conversations, but you got to get your degree first. Right. Yeah. The Joe Rogan experience is, I mean, it will go down as the model podcast for sure. And, you know, once, you know, technology has evolved past what we're doing right now and this is like long and, you know, dead and whatever, but um, yeah, no, it's, he's, he set the bar for sure. So last question and then um, Titus will transition us. Uh, and an honest question here. So when we first approached you, we like, we're basically like, we don't have any money to pay you very much. We paid you like very little for a little bit. And then you're like, okay, let's stop it. <laughs> um, what drew you to this project? Um, what, why were you, had you, had you done podcasts before and why specifically the Oregon bridge and what is becoming Oregon 360 media? What, what is interesting to you about what we're trying to do and build here? Well, um, I mean, if you'll recall, this is probably, this is not the first project that I've done pro bono <laughs> for you specifically. You're kind of racking up a tab. Ben. <laughs> that's, so that's, Wait, a, that's quite the freeloader. Yeah. My, is, my, my end goal is when you become president, then I'm just going to start <laughs> collecting on your, your 400 K. When I become president, you <laughs> will have a job and Titus will be in prison and everything right. will be wonderful <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Um, but buddy will still be pro bono even when back right, of course, yeah <laughs> yeah there'll be a lot of promises <laughs> um, <laughs> um i had let's see yeah i'd done a little bit with podcasting um when i back in oregon not on the production end i did specifically the video um but it all it all works together and that's one thing like that's been my goal specifically since i started in media um, but definitely since graduation in 2018, I, my personal philosophy is, is if it's out there, I'll shoot it and I'll, I'll do what I can to offer, uh, offer up what I can basically. Um, but I had never done front to back podcast production, um, strictly just audio production, but it just, it translated over. And as far as the subject, it's definitely something that I was interested in and intrigued by, you know, um, I, I am getting more and more actively involved in the political process, um, and have been a lot through the work that you've been doing. Then it's funny to think about the timeline too, because we were the, the initial conversations we were talking about brick and mortar, like yes. and it's it's crazy to think that so much has changed since then. Because immediately after that was COVID, and it's just like you know, worlds collided and and separated. And yeah, um, our first our first conversation was about we were like talking about maybe we could get a studio space together yeah. um, where like, yeah, that, that is wild to think about because we're definitely not even, I mean, I feel like our product is a lot more successful than um, at least I anticipated it would be at this point. Um, but we're not even close to like that being a smart business move or public health move or <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So interesting. So Buddy, and this was actually uh, your brilliant idea as our producer, but we also wanted to take the second half of this episode to sort of talk about 
uh, where things are with the podcast. And specifically, uh, and I realized actually when I was thinking when you had said this is that Ben and I actually haven't really done this before in terms of that our original thesis for this podcast, which I still hold to be true, and I'm actually really looking forward to this conversation, is that national politics is continuing to overwhelm local issues and that the national is becoming the local and that that's not going anywhere. I'm curious now, from your perspective of, uh, that was part of originally how we, I think, brought you head on was that, hey, we have this podcast, here's kind of the idea behind it, here's our pitch. Uh, After the 24, 23, 25 episodes that we've done so far now that you've listened to, how do you think that that thesis is, is holding up? I think it's absolutely true. And I think a lot of this has to do with the media that people are receiving. Um, you know, we get New York, New York Times articles, we get major headlines in our pocket by the second, and it's just getting pumped like into everyone's pockets. And those issues are deal breakers for some people. It's hard to get past those. It's hard to get past abortion. It's hard to get past gun rights for some people. Yeah, and, and buddy, not, not, not to cut you off, but such a perfect uh, example of what you just said had happened like, uh, I will say a few weeks ago from when we record this, even though we're recording this, it's like a day or two ago, is that right. Texas just enacted its new abortion law. And you had the Portland City Council, or at least I don't know if it was the city council who started, if it was just Mayor Wheeler, come out and say, Portland is done doing business with Texas now because of this law, which then I believe literally the next day they said, oh, we're not actually doing this yet because we need to talk about it more before we can vote on this resolution or whatever. Uh, That's not really the point of why I bring this up. The main point is getting back to what you said is that, and I was just talking to Ben about this before this, is that AP, CBS News, I'm assuming the New York Times, all major publications that are supposed to be saying what I say are national issues, publishing stories about Portland is going to boycott the state of Texas now. And as I'm sure, as you just said, it's not just people in Oregon that like love reading this stuff up. It's like people in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Massachusetts, et cetera. And it's those really critical issues that wake people up, like the things like abortion and the gun rights, et cetera, where I think that this is just, it's absolutely here to stay. And honestly, I think it's going to become even more hyper just as more news is consumed in smaller doses all over the place, right? Like right now we get a lot of news articles, uh, but as you know, like a lot of them are ramping up on like Instagram, right? It's like a story in six seconds now. So it's like, how can the New York Times piss you off within a six second little video posted on Instagram? So no, I think what you said just encapsulates such a perfect example of like how this device, and I'm holding, holding up my iPhone for anyone who's not watching on YouTube, it's just like going to continue to polarize us through media outlets. Well, what, what's interesting about that to me is like, Alex, your party's chances in Oregon depend on that not being true. Like, in, and that's actually what um, Stan Pulliam was getting at in his conversation was like, no, I think, I think he pushed back a little bit on the premise and was basically like, no, local issues, still Oregon issues. Like for a Republican to win, it needs to be a referendum on local issues because to the extent it's an election about whether or not the GOP candidate is aligned with Trump and going to, you know, jeopardize my rights as a gay man or the rights of a woman in terms of her, her right to choose. Like the, I think the conversation's over, like voter, voters aren't going to entertain your homelessness um, critiques because whether we like it or not, that's a secondary to most people, most, I would say most voters, um, the issues of choice, uh, the issues of, LGBT equality, like they sort of trump some of the the more local, even like allegiance to Trump actually trumps, <laughs> for lack of a better term, all other issues. Like, I think to, to your point, like if the Democratic Party's argument against a candidate, and it could be credibly believed is this person is aligned with Donald Trump and wants to do to Oregon what Donald Trump did to America, like, I don't think that there's a path for that person. Um, I don't know, buddy, what do you think? I agree. I absolutely agree. And one thing that 
is I, I feel like being proliferated is younger people getting involved in the political process, right? I th and I think that's important. I think that's something that you could speak to pretty extensively, Ben, is most of your campaigns have been, you know, grassroots, student-led. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we can attribute to this, right? It's, it's available. The information is there. Whereas, you know, in years past, it's a little bit harder to get to. You had to go out of your way to get to it. Um, but now, because it is everywhere, and people are mixing their social life with their news, those things are becoming wide, more widely publicized in a lot more places. You know, good luck. People have their minds made up. And that's, if you, one thing, if you, I was going to mention, if you haven't seen anyone who's listening, The Social Dilemma, mm -hmm. um, it'll blow your mind. It's, I believe it came out of Stanford, or at least there's producers from Stanford on it. And, and this, is, this is the documentary on Netflix, correct? Yeah, it's a docudrama. Um, a little bit. It's there's some some dramatized scenes in it. You follow it follows a a dramatized narrative. But uh, one thing I will comment on is it's seamless. The narrative is seamless. It's not like you don't go from okay we're in doc land right now and now we're in drama land. It uses some really really intelligent tactics to mend those together and weave them together. Um, and yeah, I, I'm not going to spoil it, but um, the the thesis there is it's an echo chamber where we're creating an echo chamber if you have an opinion you're getting information that supports that opinion right um and that's through ads that's through the things that you're engaging with on these platforms and then of course that transcends back into the political realm and if you get if, if one of your candidates comes out and says you know something that's radical either way they're getting pushed to either side of that chamber. So two two thoughts on this. One is um, this is part of what Catherine Gale is trying to solve in um, Final Five voting, which is interesting. I, I am actually very anxious to see how this shakes out in Alaska. Um, and like what I what I assume is that people like Lisa Murkowski, a moderate Republican senator, are going to be rewarded under the system. But it will be interesting to just actually see how it plays out. The second thing, and I think we should be clear about this, and I'll, I'll let Titus speak for himself, but we touched on this a little bit in the Rational Republican episode, where they, are, they have obviously a very different thesis from us. I am not at all saying that I think this trend of nationalization of political issues is a good thing. I actually think it's a very bad thing. I don't like it. I don't support it. Um, I don't think it's good for our democracy, but I think it's true, and I think it is um, overwhelming in many ways. I don't. That doesn't mean we shouldn't combat it. I think honestly, what we're trying to do on this podcast and with Oregon 360 and um, the Oregon Way is actually trying to push back on those forces and build relationships with people who wouldn't normally get to know one another. But um, yeah, I, I think it's important for folks, for our listeners, to know like we're not. And Titus will speak for himself, but I'm not. We're, the podcast is not about like furthering the trend or buying into the trend, but acknowledging that this is happening to our politics and we need to understand it if we wanna figure out how to make our politics more productive. Yeah, and I mean, the, the Ted Wheeler example is perfect, I think. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I've said many critical things of Ted Wheeler and I think he's a terrible mayor. Uh, I think everybody's probably pretty clear on that. But the idea that like, in some way, Ted Wheeler is literally held accountable to people who don't live in Oregon because their press office, their like just general awareness literally has to deal with news publications in New York City and Washington, D.C., like blasting out what's happening in Oregon and basically getting people upset who don't live here. Well, and uh, so he so so the mayor actually cited when he talked about he just recently came out you know, I think it was well over a week after the sort of Antifa, the Antifa Proud Boys debacle where they were like, you know, shooting actual guns, shooting paintballs, tear gas, et cetera. And the police response was essentially like, I think the quote from the police chief was, don't expect us to stand in between these people. Um, they're going to do what they're going to do. The, the mayor came out and finally acknowledged that that was a mistake and that it wasn't the right strategy. But interestingly, one of the things that he cited as like evidence of it not being the right strategy was the national media outcry. Um, so clearly it's like he is, uh, he and I think all of us is like understands that he is uh, an actor in a national landscape and not just a citywide landscape. 
which again, probably not a good thing, like actually probably a, a bad thing. And I do mm-hmm. think you might disagree types, but I think like the way Portland has been portrayed in the national media and particularly the right wing media is very dishonest and inaccurate. Um, like, but buddy could actually, you could speak to this, like what we saw on Fox news versus what you were reporting on from the protests was very different. Um, and versions of reality in both for sure. But like, I think there is a difference between like long form, you're going every day, you're seeing this every day and night, right? Um, versus like, look at this 15 second clip of something truly atrocious and unforgivable happening. Um, but yeah, anyway. Well, and I appreciate you throwing it back. I was actually just kind of digesting what I'd said earlier. Um, and that's absolutely a reality. I mean, I had, I would say I spent probably half the days uh, of the 100 day progression um, in Portland on the ground um, and a lot more posts like day 25 up until I would say 85. After that, um, things degenerated to a point that was um, pretty unsettling. But I had close friends, um, you know, family, like very concerned they're like, you know, Portland is burning, right? The narrative was Portland is burning and Portland has burned for a hundred days. Now it's not quite, it wasn't true. Like there was a couple square blocks that were, were ground zero for sure. And especially after about eight o'clock after the sun went down. Um, before that, I would absolutely support the majority, probably 95% of the ongoings um, of the organized protests and you know, the, the more nonviolent affairs, like, you know, you and I met at one point and that was at its height, probably, you know, 60 day, 65, there were 5,000 plus people down there and legislators, mayors from suburban cities. Like it was, you know, a broad coalition of people. Yes. The wall of moms and dads wearing orange. Um, I, I, I spoke to a guy next to me. He was wielding a shield. He had a hard hat on. He had a drumstick and his shield was a, like the top of a Rubbermaid tote. And on the back of his Rubbermaid tote, this, this man was probably about 35. On the back of his Rubbermaid tote was taped a picture of his son. And yeah, um, that's, that speaks, that's more accurate of what the majority of what was happening um, but then there's the other side of that. And, you know, those were the things that people were talking about was everything afterwards. Yeah. It was, and it was atrocious, like, mm-hmm. you know, but no Portland was not on fire. Um, and that's what people heard people outside of the city. That's all they heard. Mm. And, and part of this, I think is, uh, I know we're the Oregon Bridge because, of course, we're in Oregon and that's mostly what we do. But uh, I think our thesis is very correct, too, for the national landscape. Uh, And I think actually one of the perfect examples of this is like and honestly, it just it it breaks my heart in multiple reasons every time it happens. But like literally any time there's a police shooting, it's like. The media is that like it could be in the middle of nowhere, Ohio or in downtown New York. And like the media is ready to like play this stuff up on both sides, really piss people off and like actually, frankly, cause a lot of violence, I think, amongst both sides in terms of cities. Like even if nobody has actually maybe even nothing happened. But like, as you were saying before, buddy, the idea that like news has to be delivered, like someone I was talking to before. And I think they actually framed this up great. And they're like 20 or 30 years older than us. So they're, you know, 45, uh, early 40s or, or 40. It was like, when there was a big fire in Berkeley, like you might hear about it, I don't know, maybe a day or two later, right? And like, after that time, you've kind of had some time to like collect the facts, look at what actually happened. There's probably still some partisan spin. But like no one's actually rushing to any decisions in terms of like, you know, the people have time sort of to actually understand what's going on. Uh, that just doesn't exist anymore. It's like a clip gets posted on Twitter or someone wants to scoop the article to get a bunch of clicks before someone else. And like, boom, it just pulls up into a national interview and basically like actually causes people to sort of lock arms in the streets and things like that. So I think Portland is a good like 
micro example of where that's of where that's happened. But like, but by, by all means, I think that this is also just frankly a national trend. And I, uh, I mean, I think I think like the beast is totally out of the can. I don't even know how you stop something like this at this point. So like, it's not just you know, I mean, like Ron DeSantis is literally all over the news all the time, basically in every state of like things that are going on in Florida. When like, frankly, why should anybody in a Portland news outlet like care what's going on in the state of Florida? Like. Because our local news is an absolute disaster right now anyway. So, uh, no, it's a very unfortunate trend. And, yeah, I think Portland is just, like, such a great example of, frankly, something that's just really overtaking the country. Well, I think I, I think um, it's this is somewhat related to Catherine Gale's critique of the, um, the political industrial complex, how basically, like, there are players within our political system who, who essentially profit from economically and otherwise, um, economically and politically, they profit from division and fighting. And like the same is actually true in the media infrastructure. Like what happened when Trump left office? Everyone stopped subscribing <laughs> to, to the national publications. Like literally stopped, no one watches CNN. Anymore. They stopped watching CNN. <laughs> they like, and so like in some ways this is existential for the media, like their model depends on people watching and it's perhaps an indictment of our society that people want to watch when things are atrocious and awful and depressing. Um, and they don't want to watch when it's, you know, no drama, Joe Biden, you know, passing an infrastructure bill or whatever the thing For is. The majority of local news, which is not like. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and part of that to me is, is funny when, uh, and I think the New York Times is incredibly biased, both in its opinion section and with its hard reporting. Ooh. But like, to me, it totally makes sense because who are the people subscribing to the New York Times in terms of like, and buddy, you talked about their change in business model. Like you've probably learned too about their change in terms of revenues with like their subscriber base is just like skyrocketing upwards basically. And it's like, there, there was something that came out. I think it's, to be fair, I think it's 90%. Um, left leaning or democratic leaning who are their subscribers which i think is getting to your point titus yeah and i mean they're just like i mean they're making a lot of money now like i know it was i mean same with the washington post like these were like legacy publications that probably weren't on the way out but like they were spiraling downwards in terms of costs and like they'd been being reinvigorated entirely with this new business model which is like cause outrage basically I think amongst like their general left-wing subscribers because like that's who's paying for this stuff and I'm sure that there's I don't really know if there's a similar like subscription publication on the right I mean I guess you could say Fox they don't really Wall do- Street Journal yeah Wall Street Journal kind of uh I, I guess yeah their opinion section is, is definitely right wing uh but I mean yeah like that's basically the new business model in terms of the polarization is that like you just play to your consumers because they are for-profit businesses Uh, And that's actually why I think that people like, I think that the space that we're in right now is frankly where things are going to go because like, I've never hidden the fact that I'm a conservative Republican. I voted for Trump twice. I love the guy. Uh, Like, like no one, like people understand where my biases are coming from. And I've actually told this to Oregon Republicans. They never believe me, but I've literally talked to so many lefties on this podcast too. I think it's true of like, there's a much greater respect when you're just frankly honest about where you're coming from than rather when you're like, well, I'm like an economics major and like technically you're like liberal policies don't make sense because like my unbiased opinion says this, where it's like, no, like I think people are just like kind of over that crap. Like they want to know who does Alex claim to be? Like, who does he represent? And then like, I'm going to take him seriously because half of the country believes the thing that he does. Like, well, and and that's, dude, that's the, that's the newsletter too, right? The liftoff is... I write it, you occasionally will write a piece for it. And it's like, no one, we're not making a claim like we are unbiased journalists. Like we have beliefs and goals and et cetera. But be transparent about that. Like people know I've run for the state Senate. They know that you worked for the Trump administration and for Trump super PAC. Like, but they also understand that the, that that those experiences and that background um, and those beliefs informing whatever the the analysis it's more like analysis like what does this mean and why does it matter versus mm-hmm. like I think that's that's kind of the, the the central piece here is like we're not necessarily like breaking news on the podcast although occasionally we do um, there's there's at least one major story that still hasn't been reported on from what, like our first episode that is actually newsworthy um, but I think what we provide is like a professional level of analysis and insight into 
what is happening, why it's happening and why it matters for people that um, I think it's a, it's a unique space. So one, one, one thing I want to ask you, buddy, is, you know, we kind of talked about the problems of our media infrastructure and the consequences for our political system. Do you think there's anything that we can do about it on the media side? Um, obviously, Titus and I are working on the political side here, but what do you think about the, the media side? Can anything be done about these trends? Yeah, um, I think something to, that's important to realize is that in the state that we're at right now, the tools for media production have never been this prolific at any point. You know, when print was alive and well, um, you know, you, you needed a press to produce news, right? And then you needed a, a vehicle to deliver that to people's doorsteps. That's all gone. That's why print has died. Like mm -hmm. now people are getting it in their pocket. They're getting it on their computer. They're waking up to it. And, and the other important part of that is the amount of producers it has changed. It's elevated. Anyone can produce an opinion. Anyone can produce a piece of quote unquote news. Um, and I think that's, there, there's merit to that. And there's definitely benefits to that. And those, that those benefits can be seen like over summer of 2020, you know, I was looking to some of my like close friends whose opinions that I trust for other credible news that was going on, like in the other parts of the state. Um, and I think a lot of people were looking at like, stuff that I was releasing in the same, in the same right, fully acknowledging that I too have an opinion, am a human, am, you know, have my own biases. The solution that I think we're, you know, we that could be offered up right now. The only solution that I could foresee um, is media literacy. And it's something that we've all grown up with, right? At least as far as Gen Z goes and late millennials, you grew up with, you know, the post seventies, don't believe everything you read on the internet because anyone can put stuff up there. And that's true now more than ever. Um, and I think, you know, perhaps this is a little bit overly optimistic of me, but I think as the generations pass um, and we're seeing, you know, now we're in a time where the, you know, the adults, the oncoming adults of today have grown up with smartphones. They've grown up with this technology and they understand it. Um, and they understand the, the capabilities and the things that it could potentially, the harm that it could potentially do, but also the benefits. Um, it is remarkable. Think, it is remarkable to me how media illiterate uh, older generations are, um, and the things that like get shared on Facebook with like the craziest URL names and totally. like you know things that like don't are illogical on their face. And this this is for sure a bipartisan problem, but I think um, is is particularly toxic on the right right now where like conspiracy theories become fact like look at what's happening with vaccine conspiracy theories yes. um i mean like, i i think that like a lot of that stuff existed in 2016 like yeah majorities of democrats thought like russia won the election in tw like i i mean i i actually just feel like some of those right-wing echo chambers are like just as prominent on on the left basically maybe they're even a little bit more mainstream to be honest but I would totally, oh. strongly, 100% disagree with that. I definitely would disagree with that too. But... I mean, Time Magazine literally had a picture of the Kremlin taking over the White House. Oh, like... That's, yeah, <laughs> but, but that's the thing is like, there actually was Russian interference in the election. We can disagree about the impact that that had on the election, the impact that it had on voters, but like, it is actually not true that there's microchips in the vaccine. That's actually not, not an opinion piece. That's ridiculous, but it is something that, some percentage of Americans believe because of proliferation of social media to Buddy's point, it's not Fox News saying that, or at least I hope it's not, but it is this like crazy echo, echo chamber on like social media platforms that just go viral quickly. It's, it's only the Oregon Bridge that says that. <laughs> well, and here's, here's a good example too of just gener how technology has changed over generations, like phone scams, like your car extended warranty, <laughs> yeah. who's, who's the who's the demographic that's falling for those? Yeah, it's your fifty plus, like you know, someone who's eighteen or is you know younger, put like before thirty today. They're not gonna, they're not gonna, you know, their car. They 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 drive a used car that they bought <laughs> privately, and no, that thing doesn't have a warranty. Like you know? we can't afford to buy cars. That's why yeah. we don't fall for. <laughs> We're waiting on electric Subarus, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who drives an electric uh, hybrid Subaru, I'm offended by your comment, buddy. I would love one. For the record. <laughs> I would love one. 
Um, well, I think that's all the time that we have for our podcast today. Um, buddy, thank you, not just for the interview today, but for all the hours. I honest to God do not want to know the amount of hours that you've been <laughs> listening to Alex and I talk about politics. It cannot be good for your mental health. Um, but we are really grateful for all, all the time that you put into this. And I think this is a good, this is our last question for every uh, guest, but it's a little different for you. But if people are interested in what you're doing or if they want to work with you, like I think my, if you're a politician listening to this, buddy is very good at, uh, very good at uh, videos and promos and advertising and all that kind of thing. So if folks want to get to know you, see your work, get in touch with you, how do they do that? Everything is at Buddy Terry, um, my website, all my socials, um, email at Buddy Terry would be great. Uh, I will say I have, uh, this is this is my primary focus besides school these days. Um, so time is a little bit limited. And of course, I just relocated. But uh, yeah, that's where I am. And this is what we're doing. All right. Well, thank you once again, buddy. And uh, for our listeners, thanks again for your support and for subscribing to what we're making. Uh, and if your platform allows us, allows it, give us a five-star rating. And we'll see you back here next week. <laughs>